me this within about two hours of me putting this on this slide. So it was just like, do, 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 do. So this is the section of why we love fire. And um, the real answer is who the heck knows why we love fire, but fire is amazing. I mean, who doesn't love to sit by the fire? Fire is mesmerizing. Uh, it can put you in a deeply content contemplative mood. It can give you a sense of wonder and awe and mystery. And as Brian has just shown us, the control of fire was absolutely a technological turning point for humanity. Um, we've been using fire, you know, according to Wiki, on, on the order of about one and a half to two million years for warmth, light, protection, and ritual. Um, so we've harnessed the power of fire for practical purposes as well. Next slide, please. So uh, here we are a million or so years later and our modern society is still reliant on fire. Um, it's actually, you know, you might want to like hang your head to realize that we still burn things to make energy mostly, um, destroying fuels in the process. Okay, next slide. So a million years later, we still cook with fire. We heat our homes with fire. Uh, fire is in our cars and fire is in our, like our archetypal consciousness. Anyone recognize that lower right? What is that? Sauron. Sauron. The orcs are coming. So fire is symbolic, right? Deeply symbolic. I think that, uh, you know, the destruction of ego is one of the kind of, oh, go to the next slide, please. Destruction of ego, burning, you know, uh, kind of getting rid of yourself, getting out of your own way. Creation, right? Like creating a union there, like in marriage in the top right. Um, two flames come to one and then, and then purification and in general, a symbol of light and um, sharing your light with the world. But fundamentally, you know, fire is deeply symbolic. There's a, there's a very deep um, mammalian connection to fire, I would posit. I'm not reading that anywhere. I think it, the connection to us as beings is beyond concept. Uh, and it's going to probably remain a mystery of why we really like fire. Um, next slide, amigo. So in honor of Earth Day, uh, Emily gave me permission to do a little vignette here. This is, this is kind of related to fire, but let's go. Go forward, dude. Um, so our planet, good old Mother Earth, our planet and its ecosystems provision the glo global society. Um, and so there's a lot going on in this picture here. You know, you see this, the Earth, the sun, the moon, um, the earth itself has the, the core, which is fire, the mantle, the crust. We have our atmosphere, which is gases sucked to the earth. And the, the sun heating them unevenly leads to wind. The moon creates tides. Wind, moon stir the oceans, you know, with the minerals and the nutrients. And we get ecological cycles that grow the basis of uh, life on the planet and food webs. So the last thing I'll say about this slide is that two minutes of that sun's energy could power our global economy for a year. So there's some big transitions ahead, amigos. Okay, next slide. So these are the big three forces that power our world, right? Solar insulation, deep earth heat, and tidal energy. And uh, those of you who can see the chat, let's do it. Oh, go back, stay there. V quick vote on the chat, which is the most, uh, which energy is most used to power the earth's ecosystems, the sun, the earth's core and mantle or the tides? What do you think? Put them in order. Maybe Emily or Ben or somebody, or uh, I forgot, fine home building. What's your first name again? I'll write it down. Anyway, so what are they answering? Is it uh, the sun, the earth, or deep earth heat? Or are they all just staring, staring at their drinks? You're getting a lot of sun and a lot of earth. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, in units of 10 to the 24th, 3.93 is sun and 4.04 is the deep earth heat and um, tidal energy is like 1.4, 1.6. Okay, next one. Thank you, Brian. So yeah, it's deep earth heat. And that's a, that's a bit of a surprise. The inner fire. Ah, again, symbolism. So the geobiosphere, this is like the, the top of the crust up into the, to the lower atmosphere. This is the area where all life on earth lives, including plants, microbes. And remember, it's mostly microbes that live here. Um, so you look at that picture in the top left, right? This is where wood comes from. This is where the wood that you like to burn in your fireplace and wood stoves starts. It starts with 
river valleys and hills and minerals and microbes in the soil and the sun, the rain, the clouds, trillions of tons of atmosphere. Um, on the right, we see the oceans, you know, their nutrient cycles stirred by wind. It's absorbing carbon, releasing carbon, absorbing sunlight. And it is growing life, life that ultimately sinks by gravity to the bottom, gets buried in sediment, compressed, and then carried deep underground because we have a mantle, because we have plate tectonics. And it is when that organic matter goes deep underground and stays there for 10 to 500 million years that we end up with oil. So that's a very interesting place to think about. We are powering our world. You know, this is why the deep earth heat is in it. And then the chemical potential of rain. It's not just the gravitational potential of rain. And we know this from our enclosures. It's not just, you know, lap things shingle fashion, but the power of sticky is made to resist the power of aqueous chemistry. Okay, next one. And I'm going at a clip because I feel like this is a little aside, but this is a, I think it's an important aside and I'd love to expand this one day. So let them know if this is like blowing your mind in a bad way or a good way. So on the left, we see a circle. This is energy systems diagram. This is uh, systems ecology. This is classic science out of the late nineties that we have yet to pick up. And I think we should all do this. So on the left in the circle, those are the big forces that drive the world. That box in this picture represents the entire planet's natural ecosystems. It is what creates th those, those, those vast quantities of low grade energy, right? They come in and they create oil, natural gas, minerals, soils, trees, all those things I list. And then they're stored, right? The forest floor is a storage. It's like a cistern. And that is the real wealth of our economy of our global economy upon which we all depend. Like, so for instance, this is my phone. This is completely made of those storages, right? And I should turn the ringer off. Um, so real wellness to be very clear, the real wealth in our economy, we think it comes from our cunning. Ultimately, it comes from combination of our services and the planet's services. So on Earth Day, let's thank the planet. Thank you, planet. Next slide. Um, now that same box, Oh, it's, it's like a weird transition. There it is. So now that box, so that's what's so cool about uh, energy systems diagrams. You could analyze a brain cell in my brain and you could analyze uh, the planet or a hectare of forest. In fact, this is a hectare of Swedish spruce forest. And I wanted to show you how this quantifies. You have 30,000 times 10 to the 10th solar M joules. This is a, by agreement, the, the base level of unit for uh, energy on the planet. And that goes into the forest, all those systems interact and comes out of the forest as logs, it's a product that we recognize as a product. And there's 7.8 times 10 to the 10th joules in there. So if you do the math, 30,000 divided by 7.8, you should get 3846. That is the ratio of how much energy the earth put in to how much energy we took out in our log. Okay, next slide. By the way, we did not stop cutting down the redwood forest until the 1970s. Whew, I was disturbed to learn that. So we talked about this, sunlight, water, minerals, gravity, you know, low kind of low energy sources operating on vast scales lead to life forms. They sink to the bottom, plate tectonics puts them into the form that we can burn and release a very high temperature combustion environment. So deep underground into the sky, right? And I don't think Gaia, plan for that. Next slide, and I think we're done. I've totally been not following my notes. Okay, so this is about energy, and it, it, not exergy, not energy, but energy with an M is energy with memory, and uh, we really get it wrong if we, uh, if we just think about like a BTU raises a pound of water a degree Fahrenheit or a calorie, you know, so energy is pretty much defined on like what do we get out of the log, what do we get out of the burner, Unfortunately for our planet, we as a society, we don't think of energy in terms of what did the earth give us? So energy, like if we wanted to say how much energy is in these systems, it would all be the same. If I could take enough neural energy out of Emily and heat a pound of water a degree Fahrenheit, it would be exactly the same as putting it out in the sun as far as energy is concerned. Go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Not as far as energy is concerned, right? So these are ratios of energy to energy. The sun is the, is, the, is the definition, so one to one. Gas burner, 65,000. So next time someone talks to you about their 95% efficient furnace, don't forget this ratio. 
And then the neural energy, right? The genetic energy, 10 to the 22, right? We're, we are, we are the most highly embodied energy materials on the planet. Next slide. I think it's, oh, and this is a way to quantify it. It's just fascinating, but really puts it into scale. There's an environmental sustainability index that comes out of this. And look at coal, natural gas, and oil compared to these other ones. Solar would be in the 40s, just below wind. It wasn't done in this study. And wood would be somewhere around coal, between coal and oil. So from a sustainability standpoint, wood, coal, oil, gas, obviously survey says, no thanks. Okay, next one. This is the last one of this section. So right, so fire is one of the fundamental forces of our world, quite literally. It's in our psyches, it's in our cars, our homes, and in the center of our planet. And, uh, you know, also in our psyches are really powerful and destructive ideas. I want to talk to all of you listening and remind you that your ideas are as important as everything else. You remember the 10 to the 22 solar m joules per joule? That's our ideas. And so they are very powerful. They can be very destructive. Does anyone remember what manifest destiny means here in the United States? <laughs> it means we are destined to take over the planet. We have dominion over its resources. Humans are outside of the web of nature, right? Let's get beyond that. Okay, next section. And now we're gonna get a little less weird, but I hope you enjoyed that in honor of Earth on Earth Day. So what is fire, right? Um, too bad we can't unmute Allison. I'm sure he could say this without looking. Fire is an exothermic chemical reaction. It's a rapid oxidation reaction. Pause there and remember, oxygen comes from the forests and the atmosphere. So we needed those. You could not do cars, fire, you know, coal-fired power plants without the atmosphere. So rapid oxidation, it releases light, heat, and very importantly, reactant products that come out of the chemical reaction. So we know a lot about fire, but I wanna just take us a moment, and just, let's just sit for a moment and go, wow, we take it for granted, it's amazing, right? Vapor compression, again, a fundamental force of nature, we take it for granted, it's amazing, right? So let's just take a moment and say, yeah, yeah, we can harness fire, but the fact that it exists in the first place, wow, that's really, that's really something. Okay, so the next one on the right here, but go to the next slide, please, Brian. Thank you. Um, so fire is an exothermic chemical reaction. The basic ingredients are oxygen, heat, and fuel. A lot of us, I'm sure, have taken the fire tetrahedron. This is the basis of stoichiometry, right? You change these ratios and you get various musical concerts out of the fire. So the flame is the visible portion of fire. Flame is not fire. Flame is the visible portion of fire. These things right here, they pick up a narrow section. Our skin actually picks up the thermal. So it's excited molecules are so excited they have to radiate photons out to, to stay you know, in existence. Um, and the color changes with temperature. You can go to the next one. Do we remember Roy G. Biv? You know, the rainbow, Roy G. Biv? So, you'd have to actually go down to the Y. So that, like, if you look at this, the yellow and even kind of white is the hottest fire. It's near the ground. That transitions to slightly cooler and you see those oranges and toward the very top, you see the reds, right? So exactly, you're seeing this color spectrum. You're seeing the fire cooling off. And do you see the black? I tried to pick a picture where you could see the black. That is soot, that is reactants. Those, by the way, are radiating quite highly in the long wave and short wave infrared, but mostly short wave, meaning heat, like, um, like a radiant floor. That's long wave infrared. Okay, next one. So those reactants, those soot, here we are. Those, this is an electron microscope. So I wanna be very clear, this is a scanning electron microscope. Those are not, these are not the particles you see with your eyes. These are beyond eyes, beyond microscope, down into SEM. And so what we have is are very small particles that are made up of even smaller particles. So we can create a spectrum of particle size versus how many there are. And so here we go. That's the next one, Brian. Thank you. Oh, I, I goofed it. It's not the next one, but I'm going to talk about this first. It's the next one, but don't go yet. So there's two main types of fire, right? Combustion changes with pressure. I'm sure pressure. you're all thinking it because it's right there on the screen. So most of the fire we think about is at atmospheric pressure, but most of the fire we um, actually have happening on our fire on our planet is at much higher pressures, 150 plus atmospheres. Okay, now the next one. 
So first we're gonna talk about what comes out of a low pressure fire, right? So this is on the left, a flame, like a wood stove. Actually, it's a forest fire. And on the right, it's natural gas um, cooking things. So uh, on the left, you can see that, let's see, how do I orient you this? So the, the, the Y axis is just count, you know, something like a density. And the, on the X axis, you see how it says micrometers on the left? So those are very small. The 10 microns are off the chart on the right. So what I'm telling you is that when you're cooking and when you're cooking with gas and when you're burning methane, CH4, you're releasing um, bigger particles than what comes out of a fire, okay, like a forest fire. And, and that red line, last thing I'll say on this, the red line at about one, maybe if you go to a half of a micrometer, that's what my mucocilia elevator can handle. That's what our bodies are accustomed to filtering out. Now let's look at what happens when we go to higher pressures. Like gas engines are on the left. They're at about 120 to 140 atmospheres. Diesel engines on the right, maybe 160 to 180 atmospheres. So what we see is much smaller. Notice those two X axes, they're just nanometers. They're very small. And if you see on the right, the gas engine 10 to 100, Look at the diesel engine, more centered around 10. There's a really important thing to think here, right? So first of all, all of this is less than what our body's natural filters can handle, right? 1,000 nanometers is about where that is. And so look where 1,000 is. It's, it's off the chart to the right. We are, we are not able to filter these out. And then the second thing to think about is that if you put this in relation to the other ones, okay, now we can do the next slide. I think, we, I think we're cruising well. Yeah, okay, so what I've done is I've made a composite here. So I put that diesel engine on the forest fire to compare them, right? So keep in mind the red line. We can handle the big stuff. Most of what comes out of a forest fire, most of what comes out of a car engine has these three words, direct to blood. Breathe it in, in our blood, part of our bodies, right? So we just breathed it in and we called it not us. Came in, it's in our blood, now we call it us. And this leads to all kinds of, all kinds of negative health outcomes. Next slide. So I tried to do the same thing, but it wasn't opaque image. This is where cooking is. Cooking is similar to these combustion engines because of the chemicals involved. Okay, next slide. I think we're going on to the next topic. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this is it. This is a uh, real time image, uh, NASA's satellite, which by the way was defunded um, in the George W. Bush era. But this was a this is a real time picture of um, wood fires raging around the world in real time, and they studied these for about fifteen years and determined that ninety percent of the biomass burning on the planet is human instigated. So the reason this is relevant to our talk tonight is I would just like to kind of tell us that there is plenty of wood fire burning happening on the planet without us adding to it. We do not need more combustion emissions in our atmosphere right now. And we are planning to add about 2 billion more humans to the planet, many of them in impoverished countries where they do have to burn, you know, low atmospheric pressure stuff. So those of us that can rely on the otherwise wasted low grade energy around our house for heating air and water, and I'm talking heat pumps, of course, we really have a, something of a moral duty to do that, right? So the big question to us right now is, are we going to be relational and, you know, in-group loyalty, adherence to tradition, or are we going to be rational? Are we going to be fact-based? Are we going to think about what we're doing and why? And now it is Sonia, I believe. It's wood stoves. And you're still muted. All right. So Christoph was being pretty nice. I'm, I'm going to be the asshole. All right. Um, <laughs> we do not recommend installing wood stoves in passive houses or pretty good houses. Um, and just for the record, we are focusing on new wood stoves in new homes, not old wood stoves in new or old homes. Okay. Next slide, please. Next slide. Good old wood stoves. So you're saying, well, why? Why can't I put a wood stove in my passive house, my pretty good house? So this is from the epa.gov wood stove database. This is under the room heater category. And this is ones that are EPA certified for the 2020 rules. And down there at the bottom, you can see that the smallest, you know, the smallest wood stove for a room 
that 15,000 BTUs an hour, right? And it goes all the way up to 67,000 BTU an hour when you pack that full of uh, crib wood. So that small end, 15,000 BTU an hour, that is enough heat to heat a 3,000 square foot passive house on design day, right? Um, at the high end, it's enough to heat a 13,000 square foot passive house on design day. Um, if you have a pretty good house, that's a, uh, let's see, um, 1,500 square foot pretty good house and a 6,500 square foot pretty good house on the design day. Thank you. Yes. In the Northeast. Let me, let me clarify. Or, well, actually, no, I mean, passive house, the standard is, it doesn't matter where you are, right? But um, so yes, in the Northeast, in a cold climate. Um, so this is one reason that we don't recommend wood stoves for passive houses or pretty good houses. Um, actually, it gets worse, right? As you get out of the Northeast where it's cold. Um, and the reason is because like, this is for your whole house, you're gonna put it in one room, right? So you're basically gonna turn your room into a sauna and then you're gonna open the windows, right? So that's the reason, like it's not, it's just not a good match of, of you have a, a high temperature heat source and a house that doesn't need that. Um, we never win this fight, ever. I've, I've never won this fight. Um, and so when you or your clients insist on putting the wood stove in the passive house or pretty good house, um, we're gonna tell you how to do it safely. We're not saying you're gonna be comfortable when you light that off, but we're gonna make sure that you're gonna be safe, okay? Um, next slide, please. This is an example. This is a um, Wittis shaker. Um, lately in some of the projects I've been working on, a lot of people are installing them. And so these are screenshots from their installation manual. So you'll see up at the top, it says, ensure that there is sufficient combustion air in the room in which the stove is installed and that there's an adequate supply of combustion air to the stove, which can be supplied from another room or from outside. Well, if you're building a passive house or a pretty good house, it doesn't matter if it's coming from another room, there's not enough air. <laughs> um, and so our recommendation is you always, if you, are, if you are going to put a wood stove in a passive house or pretty good house, you should connect it directly to the exterior, to the inlet air uh, um, port that is, that is designed for. Um, so that period, period dot, put in an outside air connection. My recommendation is that when you plan the design, that you plan the location of the wood stove so that's a short run and it looks good. Um, so let's talk about getting the fire started, all right? Um, I've been called in, you know, I, I get calls from people after they've built the house and say, um, I can't light my wood stove unless I open a window or a door. So on the panel, <laughs> raise your hand if you've heard this. Yeah, I can't, okay. <laughs> well, that's because you can't, you can't get draft and that means like there's literally, the house is so airtight that it can't get draft. So what is draft? Draft is the motive force of the fire to create you know, air movement up and out of the chimney, which you need to do to keep your house safe. Um, and so generally when people cannot get the stove lit, um, that's because the house is most likely negative, right? So it's not so much about how much air is coming in. It's they, you just, um, you can't get it, the draft started. So my recommendation to be able to light your stove is to make sure that the house is at least neutral or ideally a little bit positive, right? Um, and we'll talk later about how you do that. Once the fire is going, now you need that large volume of air. You need the combustion air. Um, you need a certain rate of air going up the chimney. There has to be a certain volume and that needs to come from somewhere, right? Um, ideally, it's coming straight from outside through this nice little combustion air connection. Um, so let's just say like, I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna let it come through the house. Okay, great. How are you gonna do that, right? Maybe you say, I'm going to, um, you know, have a, an inlet in my basement across the house. Okay, great. Well, that cold air, if you're in, if you're not in a mild climate, this does not count for California, right? We don't, we don't care about California because that's easy, right? We're talking somewhere where, it, where, it's, where it's really cold. You know, great, are you gonna sit there while that draft of cold air rushes to your wood stove and, and, and up the chimney? Um, or maybe you said you're gonna open up a small damper near the wood stove so it doesn't come by you as it's going to the wood stove. So that is combustion air. The cleanest and best way to do this that doesn't bring cold air into the house is to pipe it directly to the wood stove. Um, and the last thing about the wood stoves is when they're, when they're dying, when the fire is dying, it loses that force. It has a harder time getting that air up the chimney. And so if your wood stove isn't tight, 
and you don't have that air piped in, as the fire loses force, it's gonna start going where the air in the house is pulling it. So if your house is negative, right? That means like if, if you have something pulling air out of the house somewhere else, those dying embers are gonna emit all that terrible particulate matter that Christoph just told you about. It's gonna start coming into the house. So, um, so an airtight wood stove is really important for those dying fires. Um, and then keep in mind that you're like, great, I don't care. It's, you know, I've got my wood stove, I've got my outdoor air supply, everything's good. But at some point you have to add more wood to the fire, right? So at some point you're gonna open the door to your wood stove. And what happens when you open the door to your wood stove and you have a, a range hood pulling 1200 cubic feet per minute out of, you know, out of your house. When you open that wood stove, you're gonna get like a flamethrower. Okay, I'm totally exaggerating, but you get the point, right? It's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna wanna come out of the, out of the wood stove. Um, so that, we'll get back to it, I'm sure, in the questions, but that, that's, my, that's my spiel on wood stoves. Next slide, please. So now I move into some fireplaces. Fireplaces are these really nice, beautiful things that are really pretty to look at if your wood stove isn't used or doesn't have a nice glass door. Again, and we cannot stress this enough, we strongly recommend not installing any open hearth, open door, wood burning fireplaces in your house. If somebody says, but I really, really, really want a wood stove or want a fire in my house for heat, do a wood stove or fireplace insert instead. They are far more sealed and actually have those outside air connection points directly into the firebox so that it doesn't have to go through the house. And if you don't get as much smoke spillage because you have doors. But if the owner says, you know what? We've heard enough of your spiel. We want a fireplace, give us one anyway. We've got some rules, rough rules. Chimney design is key to making sure that your wood stove, fireplace, insert, whatever you want to burn works properly. You'll notice that the greenhouse in the lower right corner that we've all drawn since we were four has a chimney that oddly enough lines up with the left side of that house. It means it's in board. The old greenish brick colonial inboard chimneys. The old blue house in need of a paint job, totally inboard chimneys. That keeps the chimney warm. That is rule number one, because when you are building a fire or the fire is dying, you need the chimney to work. So the chimney has to be the tallest thing in the house and go up above the warmest heated part of the house. You also want to be able to positively close that chimney when there's no fire. After the coals are cold, after everything's out and there's no more smell, nothing. We usually prefer that at the top of the chimney, not just a stovepipe damper or the hinge damper at the top of a firebox in the fireplace. You can put stovepipes or hinge dampers in, but those are more for throttling. Fire building is not, and, and tending of the fire, is not an unskilled task. You have to open a window and build the fire and open the flues and light the fire and then wait 15 or 20 minutes until you've got enough coaling to self-sustain fire on fuel logs. Then you pinch everything back so that the smoke just barely does not roll out of the firebox or come out the fire door of the wood stove if you're really on your game. Ever try to do that when you're watching kids, dogs have family over or are trying to cook dinner in a short amount of time or have a Zoom meeting that doesn't work so great? Sometimes it doesn't get quite all the attention you need or that it needs and you get a little smoke backdraft. If you're awake, that can be fine. If it's moderate, you can be fine. But if the power's out, it cannot go well. We've seen a lot of things where clients will say, we've hired a fireplace consultant and they've got these great induced draft fans that always suck a ton of air out the top of the chimney. Don't do that. We had one that recommended 1400 cubic feet a minute exhaust out the top of a chimney on a double-sided gas fireplace. And we all scratched our head going, the flue gases are only gonna be about 20 degrees warmer than the air in the house. And that's double the exhaust flow rate of the kitchen hood. Are you, are you sure about that? And it was of course a house in Louisiana. So it was rather humid 
when they would run the fire. And we ended up with a five ton condensing unit to dry and cool the air going into the house where they had a fire. No thermodynamic logic to it. So stay away from them. We've also had clients say, well, we can do a ventless gas fireplace. Don't, no, no, don't do that. That's like lighting the burners on your gas stove, not turning on the oven, the kitchen hood and just taking a deep breath. That's all that particle direct to blood. You, you don't, please don't do it. That covers most of what we run into. Generally, we still say no. If you ever have a client who says, I really want this fireplace in our bedroom because it's just, it's nice, it's, it's, it's ambiance, we love it. Make absolutely certain that that fireplace has doors. We'll tell you, so Sonia will show you why in a minute. <laughs> because as that fire dies out, we've all seen fires die. The wood turns to coals, those coals sink down, they get covered in ash. Well, the coals are mostly carbon and they're still on fire, still burning, but they're covered in ash. So they don't have adequate oxygen. What do we get? Load loads of carbon monoxide. Do you really want that rolling out of the fireplace into the room where you're asleep and won't notice it, won't notice your headache and might not wake up? Fireplace doors every time you're in, you've got a fireplace in a bedroom. So what happens if you don't follow the rules and guidelines? Sonia, I'll let you do this since it's yeah. uh, absolutely. So this data. is um this is a project we did um, on the North Fork of Long Island. It's a seven million dollar luxury home um, that just got moved into, and the clients insisted on a wood, open wood burning fireplace, and they absolutely could not put doors on it because it would just look terrible. It would ru it would ruin everything, right? It would ruin everything. <laughs> So well, we also happen to have a really sweet Masonic controls system in here. And so I can monitor, um, I can monitor it from, from away. And it's a little creepy, right? Cause I can be like, oh, they went to bed here and stuff, right? I know when they put their kid down for a nap because I can monitor the CO2 in the kids room. Totally creepy. That's not why I'm looking. I'm looking to make sure that this is balanced and getting air. And so, as, so this is up here on the top. This is a normal day. So on the left is total VOCs and parts per billion. And you can see that you know, it tops out at like 65 parts per billion. This is this is like a period of two days. Um, oh, sorry, it, it tops out at like 70. And then on the right hand side, it's parts per million of CO2. And you can see that it peaks at about 800, okay? Well, then I saw this, the next one down, and you can see the scale has changed. So the left hand side, the parts per billion goes up to like 600. And on the right hand side, the CO2 goes up to 2100 <laughs> and it goes off the charts. And I was like, holy shit, like, what happened? Did they, they host a dinner party for 40 people? And I finally figured out it's the fireplace. It is when the fire is dying, because this is, you can see the timestamp, this is like 10 o'clock at night. So I was like, either they're having weird parties, right? At 10 o'clock at night, everyone shows up. Or as their fire is going out, the people who insisted they couldn't put doors on it, they are poisoning themselves and their two-year-old child, right? Because this is from the great room where the fireplace is. I looked in a child's bedroom is the next room over and the same spike was happening in the kid's bedroom. So these people who didn't wanna put glass doors on are poisoning their own child. So this, these are the horror stories and this is, this is why we're telling you this, not because we don't want you to have fires, but we, we don't want you to poison yourselves. All right, back to you, Brian. We'd like you to keep watching and participating in this wonderful thing we call life. So some of the requirements for the chimneys come from code requirements. Yeah, okay, the top of the chimney has to be at least three feet above anything that's within 10 feet horizontally of it. And you've got to prevent the escape of embers and other products, other uh, solid particles of combustion that could reignite a fire. And you got to keep the rainwater out. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. How do we really make it work? Well, it ha generally your chimney has to be the tallest warmest thing in the house and you want to be able to close it off at the top. That's in the lower right. What you see is some spring-loaded dampers that basically you release it with a cable and they pop up off the top of the little ring that goes on top of the clay flue tile. They also make them for round metal prefab chimneys if that's what you've got. General rules for keeping it tall and warm. You want it, if your attic is within your conditioned envelope and you've insulated along the slope of the roof, you want the top of the chimney 
all the chimneys in that building to terminate at least three feet higher than the highest peak of the highest conditioned attic. So if you have a two or three story chunk of the house and a two story or one story chunk of the house, you got to build the chimney all the way up above the top peak of the top roof. Even if you look at the old antebellum South Mansion here, their chimneys are totally in the middle of the building, tallest thing above the top of the dormers, above the widow's walk, up high. Guaranteed to at least have some draft all the time because you need it. If your attics are not conditioned and you've insulated at the attic floor, you want to make sure that the termination of your chimney is at least four feet higher than the highest ceiling of the highest conditioned room, again, in the entire home. You do not want to do what we've done with lots of uh, spec homes and build these little three side exterior chimney things as is in the house in the top right. They don't work because the chimney starts cold and by the time you've burned a fire for three or four hours, the chimney gets warm. But by the time you've had a fire for three or four hours in a fireplace, it's time to go to bed. So then the fire dies and hopefully you've got glass doors so you don't poison yourselves while you're sleeping. Brian, does that work if you insulate it? It can, but it's you still have some difficulty with uh, intermediate temperatures in that volume between the con fully conditioned house that's at 70 or so and the outside. If that enclosure is fully brought inboard, you can actually regain some of the heat that is given up by the flue gases in the chimney as well. So that's, it's a secondary benefit, but it's a good bit of heat that warms up lots of thermal mass if it's a masonry chimney. If it's all prefab metal, it will function okay most of the time, as long as you take it up as high as they've taken this one. That is not as likely to backdraft, but you still want to keep them inboard because you lose lots of heat out that chimney. So the other part of this is your controls. Usually the fuel feed, combustion air feed, and flu control for pressure all comes together to one brain. In a prepackaged boiler that's got direct ducted combustion air and flu, that's all handled by the boiler controller. In a fireplace, that's handled by the person who is picking up the pieces of cordwood and putting them into the firebox. So that person has to understand all the things about draft and combustion air and understand what those risks are. You can have an automatic control with a forced, with an induced draft fan and a forced air active makeup air system. Usually that's a dial on the wall that the operator or the fireman or the fuel feeder person is able to adjust on the fly to make sure that there's the right amount of airflow and you don't get smoke spillage out the front of the fireplace. You want to keep all of your ventilation systems in your house completely and totally separate from any combustion makeup air systems. They operate on different schedules. They have different operational parameters and purposes. Don't try to combine them. It, it will cause trouble. ERVs are balanced ventilation devices. They do not make the house significantly positive or negative. They can eke it a little bit either direction, but even in a passive house, it's not enough to swing you by more than a Pascal or two. If you have any natural draft combustion appliances in your building, any, do not, do not use exhaust only ventilation in your bathrooms or your kitchens. If you have natural draft appliances, all, any fireplaces, if you really wanna use an old atmospheric gas water heater, don't use exhaust ventilation. You, your house is tight enough that you will pull the air down the chimney and you'll end up with CO or other products of combustion in your house. If you've heard of ventilating dehumidifiers, yes, they are great things, but typically they only move 100 to 300 cubic feet of air a minute, and they don't have a whole heck of a lot of static on them. So even if you do put in automatic dampers to, op to move a little bit and bring in some outside air when they operate, you can only get about 30, a third of the dehumidifier's airflow as outside air. If you go above that, you start reaching some static limits and 
to overwhelm the dehumidifier depending on where you are in the country. So we were told about this appliance that looks like a fireplace, but it doesn't burn wood and it doesn't burn gas. It's better. It is called the Dimplex OptiV fireplace. It's basically a humidifier with some lights under it. So you remember when I said if your owners really, really, really want to burn fire for heat, we really don't want you to burn anything, but if you have to, do a wood stove and insert. When you ask the clients, why do you want a fire? What do you want this for? And they say, boy, we really love the ambiance. It really looks great. This is one that takes 30, 40 watts. It flashes some lights. You can get a heat electric heat option if you want some, some heat, but otherwise it looks pretty realistic. Now we will see if our embedded video works. Ooh. So that is one actually in operation. I'll play that again in case you missed it. All that is is light reflecting off of ultrasonic aerosolized particles of water in the air. So it does act as a humidifier. It's got a tank you have to refill every couple of days if you leave it run for the couple of days. Nice. But does it make the noises? Um, no, you don't get to crackle with that. You have to put that uh, somewhere else, either on your surround sound system or, or one of the other cool wireless speakers. I don't know if you can have Alexa or Google play that from afar though. All right, so okay, it's up to me. To uh, we gotta we gotta move this faster. So I might skip a couple slides, but let's yep. just say, okay, what? So what's the damage? Like what? What? What's the? What's the total of all these exhaust fans? So I've got three homes. I've got the large luxury home, right? Which is not crazy. We've all designed homes like this, right? Four bathrooms. They each get their own exhaust fan. Two dryers, you know, because one one's not enough. And then a range hood for your sixty inch gas uh, gas range. That's two thousand cubic feet per minute, right? So in a 4,000 square foot house with 10 foot ceilings, that's still three air changes per hour, right? So it's, it's a lot of air. Um, a typical home, what I consider to be typical, is maybe two bathrooms, one dryer, and a small range hood, 300 cubic feet per minute. That's still 700 cubic feet per minute, right? So like in a 2,000 square foot house with eight foot ceilings, that's still three air changes per hour, right? It's still quite a bit of air. Um, and so you say like, what's the best I can do without a recirculating range hood? It's like, well, if you do an ERV, you don't have a venting dryer, you do a ventless heat pump dryer and you have a small range hood. So say, you know, an induction cooktop or an electric cooktop, that's 150 CFM, like, you know, wait, that's a lot better, right? We're, get, we're getting better. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and actually, so this is just basically talking about, you know, <laughs> if you wanna maintain five Pascals, negative in the house, how leaky your house would be. But let's let's skip this slide because we're, we're running low on time. So I'm, so people are gonna tell me, you know what, Sonia, like you're a little crazy, right? Like you maybe you're gone too far. I have a 3,750 square foot house. So it's pretty big and it's tight, but not too tight. It's, it's one ACH 50 and I've got the two bathrooms, the one dryer and the 300 CFM range. And so like, I'm good, right? And it's like, so 700 CFM exhaust. If I have a one ACH 50 house at this size, if I run on 700 CFM at the same time, I am negative 82 Pascals, all right? <laughs> That's 16 times what Building Science Corporation recommends for being negative. So the answer is, yeah, you're, you're still not good. So, um, so now, go to the next slide, please. So now you say, all right, shit, I'm sorry. Like, I have already done this, right? <laughs> like, I've already built this house. I already have the wood stove. I already have, you know, the exhaust ventilation. Sorry, go to next slide. So what, what do I have to do? What you have to do is make up air, all right? So next slide. <clears throat> so there are off the shelf options. So let's, let's start with uh, the easiest system. If you're in California where it's not too hot, not too cold and not too moist, then in the lower right hand corner, that's the Brone MDTU damper, right? So basically your range hood turns on and the damper opens and the air can come in and, and go out the range hood. Not expensive, not complicated, and it works just great. Let's say that you are not. So I'm only doing cold climate because that's where I am. These guys have the harder problem is hot, humid. They will take care of that. So cold climate, there's packaged off-the-shelf options, right? 
Um, the one we typically specify is on the left-hand side, it's Electro Industries package makeup air units. Um, they go up to 1200 cubic feet per minute um, for residential, so uh, single phase power, 204 volt. Just so you know, the largest one, 1200 CFM, it's a 14 inch duct, right? Um, the fan tuck in the upper right-hand corner, um, those go up to like 2000 cubic feet per minute. Similar, that's about 10 feet long. So 12 by 12, 10 feet long, like you have to find space for that in your house, right? So now the less air you have to make up, the smaller this whole contraption gets. So, you know, we, we, wanna, we wanna tunnel, we wanna tunnel through, right? Amory Lovins, we wanna tunnel through the cost, tunnel through the size. So if you can reduce the amount of air that you're pulling out of your house, then you can reduce the size of your makeup air unit. But it's not just the size of the makeup air unit. It's, we also have to heat that air, right? I can't bring in 1200 CFM of zero degree air, right? So we heat it. And the way you heat it in a package makeup air unit is with electric heater, a toaster, right? So just so you know, this 1200 CFM unit with electric heat will run two 60 amp circuits. You need two 60 amp circuits. It pulls a uh, hundred, let's see, what is it? Yeah, it, it pulls like a, well, obviously, almost 120 amps, right? So if you have a 200 amp service for your house, you need 120 of that for your makeup air unit, right? If you're building a house, <laughs> if you're building a house and you you know design it around 200 amp service and you like, crap, I forgot the makeup air, like you might need a bigger service. You might need a 400 amp service, right? So like the implications are huge. So the, the best design is to reduce the size of the makeup air required, all right? Um, and then, you know, building science has some recommendations. Sometimes you can do a hybrid system. Like you can say, I'm gonna let some air into my basement and that will get tempered by the house itself. And then I can, you know, make up the rest with the makeup air unit, you know, cause I do short duration cooking things. Like just think about like, if I bring this air into my basement for a certain period of time, what's that gonna do? So I'm not saying this is like absolute that there's no middle ground, but you have to be thoughtful. Um, you have to be thoughtful about it. All right, uh, I think I'm done. Brian, over to you. So, so the hard part <laughs> where it's hot, humid, wet, and just awful outside, they do, Daikin makes one particular unit that does a single phase and will do up to 688 listed CFM. It can heat and cool basically between 66 and 59. It doesn't do anything, it just brings the air in. That's the thing we use to help to shave off the top of the holy cow it's 104 and the dew point is 81. Okay we can at least get that back down into the atmosphere instead of clear out with the space station but you're still counting on a little bit of the flywheel effect for the hygric and thermal capacity of the house. There's a number of other things that move air through the house's envelope. So you've got some dryers that always will move some air. Exhausted dryers we're all familiar with, but push everybody toward ventless dryers. You get some heat pack that you can grab with a heat pump water heater if you have it. Otherwise, that exhausted dryer is another 200 CFM pretty easily. Exhaust fans, those pull air out of the house. And in a really tight passive house, you have to put in at least an opening to let some air come back in, or you got to put in a makeup air fan to bring in air. That either comes with a heater or a filter, or and it goes somewhere. So either you can let it filter through the walls, or you can bring it in the fan. Take your pick. Christoph, I'm going to hand this to you. Yeah, I'm going to go fast. Your baby. So buckle up. So it's just like your sump pump, um, passive capture based on anti gravity because you have a buoyant gas. You want like an upside down sump. You want a bucket. You want something to catch the air and then dump it out. Please go. Next one. Yep. You remember the old range hoods, deep sump. They relied on passive buoyancy of the air. That's Woody Delp there, LBNL, doing some walk cooking. Uh, next one. This was a self satirical commercial from a manufacturer that I recently blocked out to uh, put them in the witness protection program. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they're talking all about IAQ. And do you notice the shape of the fan? It's like they're educating the air with the arrows. Uh, air rows, good air and air. Okay, next one. Um, fiction, next one. <laughs> Remember, uh, 
so if you look on the left, the y-axis is a sum of all the nanoparticles or ultrafines. So this is, all of this stuff is smaller than our natural filters. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can see they cook more meat in dinner, more high temperature grease cooking. I know this is a bummer, but this is fact. Okay, next. Um, if you People seem to truly believe that if they have a commercial range hood and move more CFM, have a commercial range, that people will think they're better cooks and their food will taste better. It's not true. If you have high CFM range hoods, those are commercial CFMs and they warrant commercial components. They warrant commercial systems. These are systems, not components. As an industry, we really need to think beyond components and into systems. Next. And I'm trying to go fast. I apologize a little bit. There's all kinds of rules here, all kinds of rules for, fortunately it's kind of beyond the scope for today, but you know, the, the height above the cooktop, the, the horizontal width beyond the cooktop, the depth, and of course the velocity. We've listed some velocities here. I just want to point out that combustion is its own bad air quality, right? It's its own nanoparticles. So as you add combustion to the chemistry of cooking, you need more velocity to entrain those pollutants and get them out of the space. Next one. All kinds of things you can do, you know, remember, do no harm, do no harm. And in the case of cooking and combustion indoors, the best you can do is do less harm. There are these things called lids. You can use them on your walk. Use the hood. First of all, always use the hood, like turn it on first. In the EU, they have uh, heat sensing hoods that come on. They even have, uh, my mom has one, they have a, it's like, beep, the hood extends out and gets wider. Use the back burners, use lids, use low temperature. Avoid burning food. Cook outside a lot. If you like to barbecue, fantastic. Don't do it in your house. Keep your grease filters clean. Keep your burners clean. And avoid opening a window if it's actually going to move the air to other places in your home. Next. So, you know, either you filter the air or you are the filter. Simple as that. Your nose can handle some big particles. Your lungs get the rest. And a lot of it's direct to blood from cooking. I know that's not cheerful news. Next. In summary, I think I'm going to take this too fast, quickly, and then we'll do your questions. Okay, so human psychology loves fire. Humans have moved indoors. That's not a happy synergy. If you need a hug, ask for a hug. Don't go make a fire, right? Indoor combustion has consequences. Um, it does not satisfy the do no harm principle. Human biology does not love fire. Next. Oh, by the way, on that screen there, see the alcohol? I really think that's a correlation between loving fire and loving alcohol. Same thing with fishing and golf. Next slide. This is a great place to do your pizza oven. This is a great place to have your barbecue in your backyard. So if you must burn wood indoors, and notice that's in you know, air quotes and italics, use a wood stove. Better yet, examine that belief. Examine traditional practices. Realize that you've been programmed from birth to, to have in-group loyalty and adherence to tradition. That doesn't mean you have to be stuck there. And it doesn't mean your clients have to be stuck there. So work with psychology, put your fireplace on the porch, put it in your yard. Next. And I'm sorry, I'm being a little blunt and speedy. So balancing airflows, capturing pollutants, they're really important. They're, they're, they're not like, oh, they're the cherry on top, right? We build according to codes because we want to protect human safety and well-being. That's why fire code, sanitation code, structural code, they all exist to protect people. And then we, we realize they don't actually live in the walls, roof, floor, they live in the air contained by them. And we allow that air to become toxic, carcinogenic, inflammogenic. Um, it's really, um, it's not silly, it's tragic. Okay, and that's it, I think we're done. Not wood, not, bas not gas better. We as an industry, I would really like you guys to like make this your mantra. Stop doing things better. Do better things, please. Next, done. Um, I think Sonia, Brian and I are, are uh, informally agreeing to do another one about unintentional in indoor combustion, which is really fire and life safety. How do you design a building um, you know, that might catch fire and how do you stay safe during that?